So excited. Two of my favorite people in the world, uh, Ellen and Nick, welcome to the podcast. Thanks. Ellen. Great to be here. Ellen, Good to be here, Dave. Is- Thank you. First timer and very important, Nick, you are a fan favorite on the podcast. I think, is this five <laughs> for you? Yeah, quite possibly five. Yeah. <laughs> we need to get you like a, a pen for your, your service to the community in terms of like a welcome to the fifth episode, like a punch card. Oh, not, what do I get when I do 10 episodes? Oh, a sweater. That's what we're going <laughs> for. <laughs> Brilliant. <laughs> Thank you. Sweater. Um, yes. So uh, we're gathering here today and I'll give you guys the intros you deserve in a sec, but uh, I have a lot of I just get a lot of feedback from people about what do you want to learn about? What are you struggling with? And I think that Nick and I and some other people have covered some of the higher level stuff like the, the JO national world, the NCAA world, the kind of people in the 16 to you know 20 plus age bracket. And a lot of messages from people about like, I love the podcast, comma, what about the younger people? What about the people who are working in compulsories? What about the people who are working in ages eight to 12? And a lot of people are like, I work with people going through rapid growth spurts and puberty and changes and it's and rightfully so it's one of the hardest uh things to deal with as a coach as a parent as a gymnastics you know professional and a medical provider as well so um we have two wonderful people here today that i'm very fortunate to be friends with and learn so much from we have dr ellen casey ellen's the uh, national team physician for team usa the senior national team physician and she is also a wonderful sports medicine physician at hss which is uh, the hospital for special surgeries uh, premier elite facility in Manhattan, which um, I love you, but I don't love New York. So I don't like going and being there when I'm there. But uh, we've worked on some research together and we've learned a lot from each other and super grateful to have you here. And then we have Nick, the one and only Nick. Uh, I think it's 21 nations you've probably consulted with now. So all the things, elite international coach, you've worked with compulsories all the way up to the Olympic level. And I think you have probably personally coached hundreds of athletes, if not more into that level, but probably consulted and talked with thousands if, if, you know, through coaches and through gyms and stuff. So you have seen it all on the trenches side. And I think Ellen has done it all on the medical side. So I'm a, I'm a mere pawn just facilitating this conversation. <laughs> but um, yeah, uh, I think it's, it's good to go, but uh, I don't know. Let's just talk before we dive into the outline, like Ellen, what are your initial thoughts on this? And then we'll kind of let Nick chat too about his, his feelings on all this. Yeah, I think it's an important topic and certainly a great one to, you know, to share with your audience. Um, My hope is that we can provide some information that will, you know, demystify, if you will, some Mm -hmm. of the reasons that uh, puberty can be a tough phase for gymnasts and really any adolescent athlete. And the hope here is that with more knowledge and information, then we can make it seem less onerous and scary, have some practical things to to try to tackle this. Um, We can't change everything, but by understanding it better, hopefully we can make it less uh, of a stressful time. Yeah, for sure. Nick, what do you think? Yeah, I think there's, um, if if I had a pound or or a dollar, I should say, for every time I've heard someone say, you know, that they've basically written their athlete off because they'd grown. then you know i'd be really rich right now we need we need to get away from that kind of language and just appreciate the fact that yeah okay so the kids are going to grow <laughs> let's yeah. how how do we best manage that so that actually it doesn't impede performance and we can we can actually maybe we can even improve performance through that period as opposed to um losing losing performance and of course it is a long term game but maybe we just need to change our perspective really on on you know what we're looking from from a schedule perspective and and i think just manage expectations that's probably one of the key things here manage everyone's expectations that's athlete coach and parent yeah yeah i completely agree and i think we're you know we're in a big whirlwind of change here in the sport i mean i think that the sport is changing it's probably changing more in the last two years than it has in the last 20 years if i'm being honest and it's good because we have a lot of issues that we're addressing to change and one of those things is the narrative that you have to be 13 years old, 14 years old, super small, and kind of have some delayed puberty in order to be successful. And I think 20 years ago, we didn't know what we don't know, and now we do. And so things are changing. And I think the conversation of maybe pushing the timeline farther out and not encouraging so much when they're younger is allowing us to to safely get them through this this crazy time. And like Nick said, really allow uh, an opportunity for maybe you work on more of those things that you have time for and basics and strength and flexibility as we'll talk about. So yeah, I think uh, in, in the higher level stuff, the research is clear that this is a time period where there's a lot of uh, injury risk and uh, there's uh, a high burnout rate and there's also a lot of performance drops, which I think is also really relevant. It's not only about injuries, that's important, but there's also uh, just a lot of declines in performance strength and power, which, and we'll talk about why, but, uh, and then anecdotally, we all know, I mean, we're we're clinicians and we're we're coaches that we know of everyone, like Nick said, who says like, this is just so hard. I just, this is such a tough time. Like, what do we do? How can we do better here? So hopefully we can give you some of the science and also some of the practical examples of what we can do 
to help you better help these athletes through that period. So um, let's start with, um, yeah, let's maybe just, uh, Ellen, if you want, I think it'd be good to kind of give people a little bit of a bird's eye view of like what's going on in puberty, why it's so hard, what's changing. And then I'll kind of chime in on maybe what happens from more of the physical and movement point of view. And then Nick can kind of share some of his thoughts on what he sees practically when this happens. Sure. So if we think of adolescence itself as a big, you know, maturational uh, phase, um, one of the parts of adolescence is puberty. And what's so interesting about this being such a hard time for athletes is that when you look at what happens and some of the changes, a lot of them seem quite you know, um, positive, really. So during adolescence, because of physical, um, mental and social changes, there's really an opportunity to develop skill, strength improves in the long run, coordination and sort of the ability to synthesize complex, complex tasks for athletes can improve. There can be improvement in both aerobic and anaerobic power and capacity. So all of these things can enhance performance. The challenge though, is that the brain sometimes needs to catch up to these very rapid physical changes. And so it's that um, you know growth period that I think is so uncomfortable for the athlete, the coach, you know, certainly in the parent sometimes. Um, but puberty itself is really characterized um, and driven by changes in hormones. And that's not just in females. There are changes in hormones in males and females. And think of hormones as chemical messengers, right? So their job is to go through the blood and make changes or adaptations to a variety of structures. When we think of puberty, we think of sex hormones like estrogen and testosterone, but there's a lot of hormones like growth hormone, insulin-like growth factor one, for example, there are a lot of different messengers that are changing. And so these drive physical changes. So we know increased height is a huge um, you know, factor in puberty. And um, you know, certainly there's ways to look at this and kind of follow this in your athletes, which we can talk more about. But the increased height um, happens earlier in girls. It could start at eight or maybe up to the age of 14. And you can really see some rapid changes there. Boys, it's gonna be a little bit later, maybe in the 10 to uh, 16 kind of age range. And that's accompanied by, of course, an increase in weight. So you're having longer bones, you have more muscle mass. So weight increases, strength improves. Um, you can have changes in body composition. So you gain muscle, but both males and females will gain body fat as well. And then in females, you'll um, have some changes in alignment. So as the pelvis structure changes and is a little bit wider than a girl before puberty, um, what can happen is that can affect where the knees line up, the ankles line up, and in gymnastics, that's affecting landing mechanics. It's affecting what it looks like, certainly that we care about, you know, the aesthetics of landing, but also the safety of landing. And so that's really important to, to you know, notice those changes and be proactive about that. And then the center of gravity changes with all of these different um, modifications. So in gymnastics, that's huge. I mean, balance and coordination is paramount to success. And so if the center of gravity is changing, then of course it's going to take some time to adjust um, to all of those different physical changes. Yeah, I think that's, I mean, so many things are like, Light, light bulbs probably for people listening and like, yep, that makes sense. Yep, that makes sense. Yep, that makes sense. And I guess the follow-up to that is is we see, like you said, we see decreases in flexibility because of the, the long bone growth. And then we also see coordination issues. I think that's something that Nick probably is going to touch on in terms of like the ability to just know where your body is in space. So like right. a lot of flipping the low bar, a lot of kids are having issues with like, you know, tumbling and stuff like that. But I think it's important to, to realize for from the, the user point of view is that what you see has a lot of factors. There's a lot of things going on behind the scenes that it's really hard sometimes for coaches to understand, like why is someone struggling so much? And it's hard to empathize because you don't, I don't remember what I was like when I was 12 years old, like realistically, you know what I mean? So it's hard uh, to sometimes empathize with the athlete in terms of like not only physical changes, but emotional changes and, and mood swings and a lot of issues related to just being fatigued and tired. Like it takes a lot of energy to grow a human. You know yeah. I mean? So um, Nick, kind of building off that and then we'll kind of pop back into some of the results here. But what do you see practically in the gym during these age ranges that you from coaches tell you are the most frustrating or that the gymnasts themselves are, are worried about yeah and by the way ellen i'm, I'm making notes i'm learning <laughs> lots here already so this is this is this is really cool um i would say and you, you've both kind of alluded to it already but it's the frustration um and maybe i think 
let me let me rewind what's most important to these kids is progress okay as soon as they feel their progress is is slowing down or it's stagnated it's completely plateaued then that's when we're going to get motivational issues and that's often where we see that drop out of athletes from the sport now it's not because they don't love gymnastics it's because they're not getting any better and they're only because it gets to a limit as a threshold of how much they're going to put into the sport before they go, you know what, I, I don't think I can do this anymore. I'm getting no return in terms of actually improving. And it might actually be that they don't just plateau. They might actually get worse for a little bit. OK, now you mentioned there about um, hitting the low bar. That'll be a great example. Once kids have grown or as they're growing, you know, the center of mass is obviously going to be moving. It's going to be um, going to be much higher. That's going to affect the way that they're performing on beam, for example. Yes, they might suddenly be fearful of the low bar because they're going to be potentially at a distance where they could hit the low bar um, with their feet. All the skills are just going to feel that little bit different because the timing of their movements are different. You know, if they're carrying a, a larger mass, if you like, then everything is going to change in the way that they feel and perform through the apparatus. And I think that is going to um, certainly affect their spatial awareness, like you mentioned before, and their coordination and just their understanding of, of movement through time, through space. OK, and so all of those things are going to contribute to them maybe not being able to perform previous skills that they could do really, really well. Mm. And they, they, might, they might, I'm not going to say lose them, but they might just kind of Misplaced. They might just kind of misplace them for a little bit, yeah, and then they, need, and then they need to repractice, and and adjust, adjust and adapt to the new frame that they've got, and that's all it is. It's a process of, of adaptation. Now, you're familiar with my pyramid that I, I like to to use. It's a, a stage of you know physical preparation, technical preparation, practice, then consolidation, then adapt adaptation, and through a time of growth, an athlete that has built their foundations through great coaching. All they need to do is kind of go back down to a previous layer. So they had a previously consolidated skill. Now they're struggling a little bit with that skill because they've lost a bit of awareness. Again, the, the frame's different. Everything just feels a bit strange. All they've got to do is, is drop down. They go back to technical preparation, mm. maybe the drills. They adapt and get the feeling right for their new frame. And then they repractice and then they reconsolidate. You know, these skills don't just necessarily disappear entirely. Mm -hmm. Um they can be revisited and almost it's just like a you're almost relearning them yep yeah that's a really good good yeah so i think we just see um that a lot of athletes will get stuck in that period of actually just just lots of frustration and perhaps the coach might contribute to that frustration a little bit because they might feel that way themselves yeah. and and i've had lots of conversations with coaches like this you know why can't she do it she's competed this five times for goodness sakes you know this is a skill that was easy for her and now she can't do it she's not trying hard enough and it obviously, as, as we are discussing here, it's, it's not always about effort. Um, mm -hmm. These athletes could be putting 100% in, but still performing at a suboptimal level of what they've done before, just because they're growing. And that's it. It's not, not down to a lack of effort at all. Yep. Yeah, super well said. And I love kind of combining both of those into to one point of view. And I think it's, it's important to pause here. And this was something we were going to talk about later. But it's really important to pause here and really understand how frustrating this already is for the athlete going through this and i think we have and this is i would say 90 percent of people handle this really well they don't have an issue with this but there's a 10 percent minority that unfortunately add more pressure and more uh angst to the athlete whether it's a parent whether it's a coach whether it's somebody else like we have to be really supportive and really careful about this fact it could take two years for someone to go through this entire process of starting to decline, kind of hitting a low and a low, and then crawling kind of uphill back towards getting recalibrated a little bit. And I think that uh, my opinion and the mistake I used to make is I really was like, all right, let's get this over with, like give it a couple months and like, let's get back to work. We have stuff to do. And in reality, it's like, nah, like buckle in. This is gonna, this is gonna be a couple of years here. So that's kind of my two cents is we all really need to build an environment where kids feel comfortable doing that. Like the, the culture of the coaches, the parents, the medical providers has to really have tools and education about what to say, how to talk about this, but then what you should do in the gym to keep them excited and making progress and, and Hey, it's okay. This is what we're going through. This is part of it. I've pulled kids from meets because it's just like, it's not going well. You know, it's like, we're just going to do watered down sets. We'll get back to another meet in a month or two when you're feeling good in your knees and your ankles and your wrists and your back isn't sore every single day. So um, yeah, it's really good. And kind of on that, Ellen, can you speak about maybe, you know, we know it's a, a period of increased risk for injury. And um, a lot of that also comes with some of the, the negative self-esteem, the body image issues, the concern for how they look and how they're changing, especially on the female side, for sure. But the, uh, there's a, just as much on the male side that I think it's really important to highlight. So can you maybe talk to some of that? Yeah, so um, we definitely know there's an increased risk of 
musculoskeletal injury during adolescence and puberty. And you alluded to this earlier, um, Dave, in that the long bones are going to grow faster and, you know, kind of change in their length faster than the muscle and the, then the tendon that connects to the bone. So that's where you get into a lot of these sort of recurrent, um, what we call a growth center or apophysitis where the tendon connects to the bone. And so it's just yanking on that area like a tug of war really, because that's the weakest link. Once that growth center is closed, the issue is gonna be the tendon, you know, in your older athlete, because that's the weaker link. But if those growth centers are open, that, that's where you're gonna get the issue. So it starts with the Seavers, and then it goes to Sending Larson Johansson, which is a long one of the, the um, kind of the lower part of the kneecap. Then it's Ajgood Slaughter, you know, then it can be up in the hip growth centers and those stay open into high school and college. Um, so those are so frustrating, but there, you know, that's where you're getting the issue of kind of the soft tissues catching up with the, the long bones. So that's one type of injury that can occur. Another one would be um, what we now call bone stress injuries, which are uh, kind of a broader term for stress fractures. Um, and we'll get into this a little bit more later, probably talking about that bone is very hormone sensitive, especially to estrogen. And so if there's a, a phase where there's changes in, in hormones and change in nutrition demands, sometimes um, stress fractures become much more likely. So these aren't growth centers, they're the actual formed bone, but those can then have, a, have an issue with a lot of loading. And then ligaments, um, this certainly, you know, the, the anterior cruciate ligament or ACL is a big deal in gymnastics, but certainly all sports. And, and I think you probably talked on your podcast before, female athletes are up to 10 times more likely to tear their ACL than male athletes, particularly in sports like soccer and basketball, where there's kind of equivalent skill sets. And part of that is anatomy, how their bones are shaped. Part of it is biomechanics and motor control, how they move and land, like I mentioned. And part of that is hormones. And that in and of itself could be a whole podcast. And that's what my own research focus is in. But you know, the point is, is that ligaments and all these tissues have receptors for sex hormones like estrogen and testosterone. And so the actual strength of the ligament and the bone and the muscle can change during puberty and after. Um, and so these are things that we can't even register mentally or how our body feels, but that's happening on kind of the micro level all the way out to the macro level, which is what we see and feel as athletes and you all see as coaches. Yeah, very well said. And I think that you definitely hit the nail on the head with like, in terms of why they get sore joints, why, like, why do you get shins or the, the shin issue? Why do you get the hamstring issue? That's exactly why the long bones are growing so quick, yeah. but we also have to remember that that the bone, like you said, where those attached to those high force points are not fully formed. They're open. It's soft bone. It's not callous. So that's why severs hurt so bad. But next to nerve pain, bone pain is recorded as one of the most painful things. So like, yes, when they say their heel hurts and they're limping around or their high hamstring hurts or something like that, like you really got to take that seriously because you get a stress fracture. It's a nightmare. And I think on the other piece, and then I'm going to kind of share some from the PT side of what like timelines look like is um, you have to remember that from a neurological point of view, you were used to having arms that were this long and now you have yeah. long plus two inches so your brain's like what is happening right now? So you have coordination issues and you lose strength and power because the length ten tension relationships of those muscles are now what not optimal they're not like really where they sat before so that's why you lose strength and strength is a function of power with velocity that's why you lose power because the muscles themselves are think about like how strong your arm is when it's completely extended like you can't exert as much force from end range and mid range is where you are so when you have that rapid growth the muscles themselves have a problem. And I know a lot of people are going to want to know how long does it take? What's the timeline? And I can share with this. I've treated a lot, like easily a thousand people for different growth plate injuries. And, and there's four phases of rehab that I want people to really understand. And the second piece is I want people to really see the variability in timelines. If you have a, someone who has a growth plate flare up and they get a knee issue, like an Osgood slaughters or a hamstring or a, a wrist thing, it's immediately recognized. The coach understands and modifies and takes care of it. There's probably on the lower end of when you're going to have timelines for each of these four steps. I'll explain versus I've seen a lot of people who have hamstring pain for two months. They keep writing it off. Then they try to do a couple switch leaps and it really I hear a pop and it really has an issue. And what they have is they have a fracture now of their growth yeah. plate. And so that's on the way other end of the spectrum in terms of how long that's going to take. So the four phases that I explained to every gymnast, every parent, every coach I work with is just four phases of one is putting the fire out, 
Two is going to be being a normal human again. Three is being an athlete again, a general athlete again, which many people miss, especially on the medical PT side. And four is when you're a gymnast again. So there's a two to six week window for each of those phases that I tell people about two weeks. If you're on the quickly took care of it, no big deal. We're going to get back to it. And you can train in this period. You don't have to stop training. You can modify, but there's probably a six week window for that. Put the fire out phase. If you've gone four or five months with this and you haven't got it taken care of. So two to six weeks is going to be when you're like, ouch, this really hurts. And I, I can't walk well. I can't squat down to grab my bag or stuff like that. Then you have two to six weeks where you're focusing mostly on just being a human again. Can stairs, can you go downstairs? Can you squat? Can you sit in, um, sit in school all day long and stuff like that? The third phase of being an athlete again is when we're doing strength and conditioning of like, okay, let's get you stronger. Let's get you kind of, let's work on some of these uh, big issues you have. Like in the second phase, maybe your ankle mobility is very stiff and that's why there's more pressure on your knee. Maybe you haven't done a lot of direct glute training and that's why your hip and your hamstring is maybe taking more of the brunt. Um, so that's the second phase. Third phase is just like, okay, be able to run, be able to jump, be able to squat, split squat, step ups. That's what we're working on in PT when you when you go there. And then the last phase is a return to sport phase. Like, okay, how many, are we gonna start on tumble track? Are we gonna start on the foam pit? Are we gonna start with soft landings? How many landings? We write a specific program of how, how you're gonna dose yourself up over it. So it could be from two months on the best case to six months on the worst case if you're having someone who's really pushing along. So long-winded, but I, I want people to understand how serious these things are. Um, yeah, go ahead. I just, that's fantastic. And I'm gonna borrow a lot of that language <laughs> in the clinic. I think it's amazing. And what it, what you're doing, not only is you're obviously basing your treatment you know, plan in sound science um, and medical evidence, but you're, you're laying out what the, the range might be so that people are prepared. And I will say that I think we don't, certainly sports medicine physicians don't do the best job of that all the time. You know, you give them the diagnosis and you just, you don't want to make anybody feel bad. So, hey, let's try to get you back as soon as possible. But if you don't share that this could be, you know, six weeks in each of these phases and what the markers are to move to the next phase, you're really doing someone a disservice and you're setting yourself up, I think, for a failed treatment plan, which clearly, you know, you're not doing. But just in the general sports medicine community, that is something that we need to do better with is talking about how long this might be, what you need to achieve and what, you know, the, you know, the pain score and everything else needs to be so that it's less subjective and less terrifying. And there are some actual just short term goals like you do learning a skill. Yeah, absolutely. And, and learn from my mistakes as a younger clinician as I was, you know, saying ridiculous timelines that weren't in line with the empirical evidence in terms of how fast these things are going to get better. Or it was like the, you know, oh, this, these three exercises will fix you because like, oh, we have this fancy new course that I went to and blah, blah. blah. It's like, guys, let's be real, realistic here. Like, don't, don't uh, dig yourself in a hole as a provider and promise something that you can't deliver. And that's why it's an art and a science. And we, we have a lot of doctoral students that we mentor with this. It's like, don't ever be concrete. Don't promise anything like, Hey, this is what we think. This is what the evidence suggests. Here's the best case scenario. Here's the worst case scenario. Here's where we're at. But also look at the positive, like make a plan for them. Like, okay, here's all the things you can do still at practice. And this is where I want to ask, ask Nick, this question is yeah. you know, like giving them a hope of like, this is what's going to happen. This, yeah, this stinks. This is not ideal right now. It's never a good time to be hurt. We might have to miss these big competitions and I'm sorry, but like your long-term goal is what we're looking for, but there is so much that we can do. And let's treat this as an opportunity. Say we get over these first two to four weeks and then we really do a good job with the next month of getting you stronger, getting your ankle flexibility turned out. Maybe you can use this opportunity to clean up some of these basics and things that are maybe a headache for you, but you haven't had time to kind of go back and, and kind of dial in. So um, Nick, for, I guess on the, let's talk first, maybe like a, a physio has told you like, Hey, it's, we're gonna need a month on this where we can't, we can't do a lot of aggressive kicks or leaps. Like what are the things as a coach that you're thinking about? Okay. Well, how can I use the time? Or like, what do you think we need to focus on as, as coaches during these, like, you know, first hot, so to speak, two to three months. Yeah, I think you hit the nail on the head there when you said that um, there's always opportunities that you can find to work on things that you hadn't previously had time to do. Because we're all, it doesn't matter how many hours we're in the gym, and I know that kind of, there's a big debate about how many hours that should be, but it doesn't matter how many hours there are, we always as coaches seem to want more, right? And, and that's because we can't fit everything in that we want to. So you kind of got to see these opportunities in some ways as a gift. You've been gifted a, a month period, a two month period where actually, now you're able to focus on something which normally doesn't get any attention or as much attention as it needs to. And you've now got the opportunity to, to, to I don't know, I want to say fix it, but, but to work on that. And, and then ultimately, when the athlete does recover from whatever 
uh, injury or kind of period they're going through, they might be better off because of it, because they've had this investment of time. And one thing that we've certainly seen in the pandemic is everyone was was terrified about having months off. And actually, you guys know this as well as I do, probably more so. We've got so many athletes around the world saying, you know what, for some reason, and I don't quite understand why, I feel better than I did beforehand. And we're and all of us are going, okay, what's going on here? <laughs> that, that, that's not in the textbook. That wasn't supposed to happen. Um, and we've made this assumption that, you know, gymnasts can't rest properly. And like you said, just because they have an injury or maybe they're, um, you know, they're seeing or seeking medical treatment for one particular aspect of their training doesn't mean they need to sit at home and not participate in sport. We have to adapt to what they can do in the gym anyway. So it's not just, you know, let's cut all our losses. Let's go home. We're not going to train for two months. There's always things that we can do. Mm. Um, now, for, for a lot of athletes that could be working on their handstand line, it could be improving their, their shoulder range of motion. If it's a hip issue, for example, it could be, as you mentioned before, um, ankle range. There's so many different things that that don't get the desired attention um, or the res sorry, the required attention that they, that they deserve. And so we've just got to look for as many opportunities as we can and help manage the athlete's expectation. I'm going to keep coming back to that because I think that's the most important thing here is as frustrating it is for, as for a coach, it's nowhere near as frustrating as it is for the athlete who sees their teammates continuing to make progress and sees their teammates achieving new skills and, and uh, maybe working towards a competition that they should be at, but they're not going to be at. And that's a really difficult time for anyone to go through let alone um you know a child a 12 13 14 year old um child to deal with those sorts of emotions so we've really got to manage their expectations and and somehow try and get them excited about those opportunities about what they're going to be able to do um to improve them throughout yeah. that period and i would also say and i kind of want to hear your is a, a question back to you but also in my opinion it's like uh, uh allowing them to say it's okay and like this is normal don't worry about it like don't don't I don't know what the word I'm trying to say is, but like, don't make it weird or don't make it a thing. They're like, oh, I can't believe we have to. Like, as a coach, if you're like kind of having that mentality of like, oh, this is such an annoyance, like growth, uh, like injuries, like if you have to normalize that and make them feel okay, because if they see that you're okay with it and that your parents are okay with it and the teammates, like, oh, yeah, this is part of it. Give yourself a couple months, like, we'll, we'll get through it together. They feel like, oh, okay, <sighs> fresh, like breath of fresh air. There's no, like, there's a big weight off the athlete's back when the culture allows them to kind of go through that and be fine. Um, so, yeah, I don't know. What are your thoughts on that before I share a couple more things? I totally agree. I mean, we, we know that the athletes will pick up on every change in our behavior, our change in language, our change in body language, our frustrations. You know, this is that's just how we work. We're able to pick up on those things. And the kids definitely do. They don't miss a thing. So, yeah, if the attitude towards growth is is one that makes the athlete feel guilty for something that they don't have any control over, then I think they're in a really we're in a really bad position as a coach. Like that's just absolutely not what we should be doing um there's so much uncertainty for the athlete already around that period and then the fears that might be going through their head i mean the last thing that we should be doing as a coach is is making them feel guilty about that process so yeah managing expectations reassuring them normalizing it um you know it's just the it's best it's just good coaching it's just best practice yeah. i don't i don't know why anyone would not want to do that yep um so that's yeah. what we need to ensure Absolutely. And, and I'm going to throw in the comma caveat because I want to make sure we don't let people off the hook here is like nine, like I said, 90% of people are handling this period. Well, not to be, of course, definitely some people who, um, I think if, if you get seven kids in your gym with severs, you should maybe have the first conversation with yourself about like, okay, pause. Is there something that we're doing with training load or with strength and conditioning or not having a, a medical provider on hand? Is there something that we should reflect on and figure out what's going on? Because I do think there are some times when I hear about people like, yeah, like, eight girls got shin splints and it's like it must be it must be this it must be like the sport i'm like mm, eight people that's a trend you know that you want to find to be aware of so pause for a moment if a lot of people are getting heel pain or back pain i get a lot of dms about that about like hmm, everyone has wrist problems like what 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 exercises can i do to fix that i'm like eh you know, be patient and maybe look back on it so my value that i want to add from the pt side of you is a lot of coaches are also kind of like okay gymnastics is hard you get sore and people have aches and pains like when is the line between this is just normal and don't worry about it. Or like, okay, I'm a little concerned. We should get you to see a physio or a medical doctor or something like that. And for me, I have like a rule of three. So if it's the third time it's happened and limited your practice, start scratching your head. If it's more than a three out of a 10 in like a subjective pain scale from zero to 10, 10 is hospital, zero is like obviously no pain. Start to scratch your head, right? And also if it's three times that the athlete is like consecutively complained in a row that this has been a problem, right? If like, like, yeah, it's just my hamstring. Like I can't leap because my hamstring hurts and then not a three rule, but the closer to the joint it is typically 
the more concerned you are for like growth weight and stuff versus like if you have quad soreness, it's like in the middle of your quad or like your hamstrings. But if you're like hip flexor and your hip joint itself hurts or your knee bone hurts, you need to start, you know, scratching your head. So under those thresholds, if it doesn't get worse the next day, if it's not lingering for a couple of days, I'm like, okay, you know, we'll just dance around and we'll see how we can modify around it. But if it, as a coach, if it starts to stay consecutive, I send my athlete to another medical provider first before they see me. And I'm like, get this checked out, make sure there's not a small little stress fracture or something we miss. Cause you never know, you know what I mean? So, um, those are my kind of two points of, and maybe Ellen can share more, but Ellen, I definitely want to pick your brain about, you know, more on the female side, like the menstrual cycle, how does that roll in? And then also the, the end of, I think it's a highly contextual individual nature. Some kids grow real fast when they're 11. Some kids grow real fast when they're 13. Like, can you kind of talk about why that is from a, a, a hormonal point of view? Sure. Um, so we cannot have a discussion, of course, about puberty and sports and not talk about the menstrual cycle. Um, but just so we're, you know, all your listeners are on the same page. So the menstrual cycle is basically the hallmark of puberty in women. And um, what it is, is it's basically cyclic fluctuations in different hormones. We think of estrogen and progesterone primarily, but there are others that drive this process from the brain down um, to the ovaries where these hormones are made. And of course, estrogen and progesterone are known for their reproductive functions. But as I mentioned earlier, there are receptors for these hormones throughout our neuro, so brain and musculoskeletal system. So they really have effects in every bodily process. Um, and so the menstrual cycle usually lasts about 28 days. The first zero to seven days are menses, which is a withdrawal, you know, bleeding, um, where the uterus is shedding its lining. Then um, at that point, the hormones are both quite low. And then estrogen starts to rise towards the middle of the cycle. When ovulation happens, it drops down and then rises a little bit later in what's called the luteal phase. Progesterone stays low the whole time except for the end of the cycle. And, um, you know, for the most part, people don't have any idea where their hormones are in that cycle. There is a, a push for female athletes to track their periods and try to tailor their training around hormones, which I think is an interesting um, concept, but needs a lot more research in that region. Um, but but what, you know, what happens is the cycle goes on and on. And so there are some kind of mini changes into the hormones and that can affect um, how people feel and how they train. The very first menstrual cycle that a female has is called menarche. And the normal time to have that can it be anywhere from eight years and normal to be you know, categorized as normal, you should have it by the time you are 15 years old. So it is very common for gymnasts not to get their period by that time. And it's common for them to not get it for even the amount of time that they're in the sport. And I wanna repeat, while that is common, it's not physiologically normal. And um, we do need to pay attention to that because there is a widespread belief that gymnasts don't get their period or runners or whatever you know other highly trained female athletes are. And again, it's common, but it signifies, it certainly can signify that there's not enough um, nutrition and energy available for the athlete to have you know, the, the calories on board to have a menstrual cycle repair tissue that's, you know, been broken down with training, build bone, um, and all of those things kind of uh, collectively are what we know as the female athlete triad. Um, and so for gymnasts, we know that, that the onset of puberty and the menstrual cycle is later. Um, there have been some studies to compare elite athletes to, you know, the normal, um, you know, regular girls. And so elite athletes are more likely to be in that 15, 16, 17 year old age range. Um, but it's, it, it's not just the sport and the training that are factors there. I mentioned nutrition is a factor, um, stress level, um, both, you know, stress from training as well as, you know, how an athlete might be feeling. And then genetics plays a huge role too. So if there are some delays in puberty in a gymnast, it could be genetics only. It could be stress. It could be nutrition. It could be training. Um, Regardless, I think what I would recommend is it's worth investigating and involving, um, you know, maybe a team of people um, to kind of look at what might be going on. Because if there's ways to intervene and increase nutrition, that can be helpful. If there's ways to manage stress, that can be helpful too. 
because what you don't want is for it to just be thought of as, you know, oh, no big deal. None of my teammates have it either. It's fine um, because it really can signify that there's something going on that may, um, you know, impair an athlete's ability in the gym and certainly their long term health. Yeah, super well said. And I think the, the biggest kind of takeaway there is this, this really highlights the need for, in my opinion, a different model of how we approach training young athletes in our sport, which is much more interdisciplinary based and much more education based from science and the evidence and following what the best practices are. And, and Dan Lonsdale, a friend of Nick and I's, has said it perfect in the podcast that gymnastics is unique, but it's not different, right? So there's this idea of like, oh, well, gymnastics is different or like nobody understands. It's so, it's so unique. Like, Yes, in a way, but also humans are humans, kids are kids, you know what I mean? Like it's the same same systems that we're working with. And so I think we really need to do a better job of, I, I have empathy for coaches because we ask them sometimes to be technicians and strength coaches, mental health providers, like it, we dump too much on their plate. And I think that we need to really revisit how we best build teams at a local club level because the college level, the elite level usually has these systems of people to help out at a national level. But at the club level, how do you how do you build your team of people that are kind of same value, same principles, but you have on speed dial for nutrition or mental health, because you can, as a coach, be like, Hmm, okay. Self-awareness, this is important, but it's not my lane. How do I get that person in the right thing and not make it weird for someone to go to a nutritionist or go to a mental health provider or go to a, a doctor or something like that? Just be like, yeah, you know, this is part of it. all the people here are here to help you. And like, if you have a doctor come to your gym once per month and just touch base with people for consulting, like just saying, how are you doing? How are you feeling? Maybe in that conversation, someone's like, yeah, but by the way, you know, I'm having this issue with my with my period or something like that. And like, OK, here you go. Here's the person who can help you out with that. I think it's really important. We normalize getting away from just causing just making gymnastics coaches kind of do all of these things, which is which is very challenging. So. Right. If I can, I want to just add one thing to that is that, um, you know, and you have done great work in the workload tracking and sort of management and looking at that in, in gymnasts and that's so needed. But what really, I mean, you know, as a female athlete who was really not excited to get her period, you know, when that, when that happened, I mean, I can empathize. It is not a fun kind of concept to think about dealing with. It seems like a hassle, but what I have since learned and really appreciate is that, you know, female athletes have one way to kind of monitor their workload that males really don't. Because if you have your period and it's regular and the cycles are regular and you just, you know, kind of track it on an app or your calendar, you can know um, that you're probably getting enough nutrition. You're probably managing your workload. It doesn't mean everything's perfect, but that is almost a superpower, if you will, that you get to be able to track that. We don't, you know, males don't have the equivalent. And so as much as it's thought of as like, oh, this is the worst and we have to kind of deal, deal you know, female athletes have this additional barrier. And I'm not discounting that. I certainly felt that too. But it's an amazing inherent tracking system for if you're fueling properly and you're recovering properly. Yeah, very well said. And I think this would be a great kind of transition into kind of like, what do we do in the gym and how do we monitor these things? And, and Nick can kind of share some ideas here. And you mentioned the workload and you mentioned stuff. And I do want to say, again, 90% of people are doing a great job and it's not an issue. However, People, there's some people who need some really hard conversations with themselves about how, how many hours do we have? And it's about number of hours and quality of hours, which I think I definitely want to hear from Nick on. But I mean, I've seen people do 25 hours great. And I've seen people do 20, 15 hours terrible and like just really trash kids. And I've seen people do 25 hours, well-programmed, well-balanced, lots of different ways to do it. Flexibility, strength, mental stuff. Like they really do a great job with 25 hours. So I don't want to say that's not important. I recognize that. However, um, we need to really look at the IOC guidelines and what they recommend for age training hours. We need international and consensus statements from from a variety of people to give guidelines for how many hours should a ten year old train. When when's it okay to go level ten? When's it okay to do you know elite, junior, elite stuff like that? There's no golden answer, and it's it's certainly a Pandora's box. But like we need that conversation. We need that to happen. And if you have a lot of people who are not really progressing through these years, or your, your attrition rates high in the in this puberty age, like maybe you need to really think about. Okay, how many hours are we asking them to do? What's the training look like? And do we have the tools necessary to handle these things well and get through this safely? And that's where we'll kind of go on to like tracking and monitoring and stuff. But I do think that the conversation on um, training hours, youth specialization, year round training and gymnastics with the pandemic is changing, which is great. And I think people need to not get so defensive and reflexive when people talk about like, maybe we should change some of these guidelines and stuff. Like there's a way to get high performance but not, you know, be so stressful in the, in the 10 to 14 age range. So, um, Nick, it goes to you. I have a, I mean, there's probably eight questions in there we could talk about, but <laughs> number, number one is, um, we're not going to tackle the hours and the training. So that's a separate podcast. 
<laughs> you know, when I hear early specialization, I'm like, oh, I don't know if yeah. I want to deal with this. <laughs> yeah. that for another, another forest. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. We'll but let's talk about day, yeah. what people can do in the, cause I really, I, I really want to know your, I don't think I've ever asked you this before, maybe specifically, but like, I really want to know what you think younger compulsory ages coaches should be focusing on in their training before this kind of storm comes. And then I would definitely like to talk about, okay, once we have those yeah. basics or whatever you feel is important for those younger ages to focus on, what can we do during these growth periods to, to have a, a marker for, are we growing? Are we not? Are we progressing? Are we not? So first let's tackle the, what do you think the younger coaches in, should be focusing on? <clears throat> okay. So yeah, yeah. With the younger athletes, Ult ultimately, um, I mean, basics is a broad word. It can mean an, an awful lot of different things, but for the benefit of what we're trying to talk about here, which is transitioning as many young athletes through to senior athletes as possible. Let's just say that's the objective. And that should be everyone's objective, of course, is, is about long-term performance, not short-term performance. So whenever we're making decisions, it should be based around what's the best thing for this particular athlete in the long term, not can they get through level five in two weeks time? Um, not that they're injured, but we're going to push them through level six anyway. It's no, what's their long-term potential? That's what we need to base these decisions around. Um, basically what I think that we need to be concentrating on a lot of it is movement, general movement competency. And I know this crosses over massively between gymnastics and, um, and the work that you do in the PT world and physiotherapy, et cetera, but general movement competency and shape, because what we, what we can say is that if you haven't established great movement and great shape before puberty, then you're probably going to really struggle when the gym mass is out the other side, because it doesn't get any easier. You know, when, when those bones do lengthen and inevitably you're going to get some, uh, some more tension, you're going to lose flexibility. Those, you know, losing flexibility and mobility will not help shape, you know, and when I say shape here, I'm not talking about the aesthetics of how a gymnast looks. I'm talking about the specific shapes that we require to perform gymnastics, such as a handstand, such as a hollow position, such as an arch position. Um, you know, the going through the motions of doing a, a giant swing, for example. That's what I say when, when I'm talking about shape. Okay, so we, we really need to make sure that we establish as good a foundation of general good movement, mechanics, if you like, and shape as possible pre puberty before the athletes go through that period of peak height velocity which i'm sure we're going to talk about um because that gives them the very best chance of being able to kind of hit the ground running throughout that whole period really and, and when they get around the, um, through the other side the same goes with strength because as you'd mentioned there, there is the potential to gain more strength on the other side of puberty but whilst we're going through that period and correct me guys because you're the scientists here if i'm saying anything that's wrong but whilst we're going through that period the athlete will experience losses in power um you know an explosive strength like you mentioned before dave so again in order to fully support the athletes um puberty or that phase of puberty we want them to be as strong as possible before it even takes place mm. and we've always got this debate about when we should we do resistance training with young athletes etc and i believe that we speak from the same hymn sheet here or sing from the same hymn sheet which is if it's done safely with um you know with good supervision and it's done controlled and we're not con um, we're not compromising form and quality of movement. There's no reason why we can't do some form of resistance training with these young athletes before they even go through that phase of puberty. And so I'm a big fan of preventative work, which a lot of us would, would loosely call prehab, wouldn't we? So that could be working on the glutes, the hamstrings, the hip flexors, um, not because there's actually an issue there, but because we're proactively trying to make sure that we don't have issues in the future. Mm. And and as Ellen mentioned, and, and you did as well, you know, one thing that I see a lot of is, is issues around the hip, um, sort of the hamstring glute attachment, like very high up. And that's a, cl a classic example of you know, if we've got kids that are doing bad landing positions, maybe they're running with bad technique, it doesn't necessarily matter too much physically when these kids are young. And, and technically, you won't see the consequence of that. But but there is a consequence. We just don't see it until it's too late. Mm. You know, when that athlete and that bone starts to starts to lengthen, and I use this, this hamstring hip example all the time because it's a really good one. But, you know, with poor running technique, with poor landing mechanics, um, there's a tremendous amount of strain on that kind of pelvic site. And you just won't know about it when they're nine, 10 years old, because the kids typically will be absolutely fine. They'll do everything that you tell them to do. There'll be no problems. And it's unless you're really thinking proactively about, okay, that's not going to be the best landing for when she's 13 years old. Mm -hmm. It's working for her now. She's 11, but actually this might compromise her later on. So 
we, we, we need coaches to be thinking about those kind of movement mechanics. And of course, the only thing that's going to help coaches do that is being educated on what those red flags are. You know, what do we need to be looking for? Is that a valgus position at the knees because the glutes aren't firing properly or, or there isn't enough strength work in the lower limb? pre-puberty is that a bad landing position or poor running technique is it uh, an anterior pelvic tilt which is going to cause all sorts of problems again with with maybe core strength um you know range of motion through the hip again what's happening at the glute and hamstring and if we don't resolve some of those issues pre-puberty i'm not saying that we can't fix those we can't resolve those later but it is going to be more challenging and so we want to use that that young period when you know the kids have got so much energy they can come in the gym and and they'll they'll really make rapid progress you know their rate of progress at that age is is remarkable we want to use that window of opportunity as much as we can so there might be a lot in there oh it's great but but it's i know it's quite broad um but nothing is more important than just general movement competency or physical literacy whichever nice term you want to use to describe it yeah, absolutely. And I, I'll, I'll kind of share a little bit and then I definitely want to get Ellen's perspective on the, again, females going through this period of time, uh, time is hard. But and, and I think summarizing what you said is like really good basics, really good, you know, strength and foundation technique and enjoying the gym, having fun, but just getting all of the basics of all these things, right? Handstand lines and tapping and tumbling basics of mechanics. And I have to sing your praise because I think you have the best premier content on how to do this. At, at, a, at a technical point of view when these athletes are younger. So like, if you're a coach and you're like, I get it. Like I need, I, I know that I need to do this, but I don't know how to write a strength program or I don't know how to, you know, do uh, what basics should I do? Like your daily does like, what should I do substance wise? We have loads of other podcasts and other resources in your membership and stuff like that, that people can literally get all the things they need to, to build those programs for success as they enter this, this, this kind of chaotic time period. So definitely check out those resources. But um, Ellen, from your point of view, if you see people at this young age, what are you, what do you see as common in this? Like, you know, the parents are worried about, or you're, you're seeing in the athletes that are like, they're having a lot of struggle with, and, and what are I guess pieces of advice for people that are, are helping people through this time period? Yeah. Um, I think, you know, the, the challenge is I don't usually see people until it's become an issue enough so that they're not able to do the sport that they love to do. Um, I think Nick makes just a brilliant point about, you know, it's the mechanics that you're learning years prior. And then you don't, you know, you don't, that doesn't really herald itself until there's pain, but that's been going on for a long time. And it's kind of like, you know, being kind to your future self or paying it forward, right? With the mechanics that you're learning because you can get away with it to a certain point and then, and then you can't anymore. Um, it's hard to obviously convince people to make those changes when they're not having you know, the pain or the negative effects uh, related to that. But of course, that's the wonderful work that both of you do. Um, I think for me, it's, you know, when I see someone at least taking the opportunity to explain what m might be going on and what some of the factors that could lead to this, and then um, setting the stage for just what you've talked about. Um, while they're not doing the rehab with me, I do try to make it a point of this is an opportunity to obviously deal with this and hopefully, you know, optimize your mechanics, prevent things in the future and, you know, like lay the foundation for what they're going to then hear in physical therapy and then back when they're in the gym. Um, you know, and I think too, um, if they're coming in for a growth plate issue, it's, it's not too soon or, you know, um, it makes sense to talk about menstrual cycles and, and, you know, reproductive health and puberty and what that means to them as athletes, but also their, their future health, because really just screening and education can um, circumvent and prevent a lot of the issues that, that can happen. Um, but the challenge is sometimes it feels uncomfortable to talk about, or the, you know, the athlete doesn't, isn't comfortable hearing that the parents might not want to hear it, but, but that's the whole point of sort of taking away the, um, you know, the fear about it or the uncertainty and normalizing Pu puberty happens to everyone, right? Mm -hmm. If you're going to, you know, be a, a live human and mature, it's going to happen. It's like aging. There's parts of aging that are no fun, but it beats the alternative and trying to prevent puberty or avoid it or get yourself around it really only leads to more uh, devastating consequences and injury. And so we have to accept it. We have to embrace it and make the best of it. Yep. Yeah. Super well said. 
And I think we're, we're doing a good job of kind of chronologically moving through, you know, the background and what's happening before and after. So let's kind of spend a little bit of time on what's what we can help people or what they should be focused on during these time periods, like the things that are really important characteristics and I'll share from the PT. And then I do want to kind of end on saying like, what are the, you know, a little bit of a, a disclaimer warning of what happens if we don't do this well and we don't handle this, this situation well. But for, from my point of view, what I'm trying to do is from a coaching point of view, when I have these athletes going through it and also on the medical side, when I see a lot of athletes who come to us, whether it's for they want strength and conditioning services or they want medical rehab, whatever it is. For me, it, it, it really focuses around education starting about like, again, like you said, teaching someone about these things that they're OK, they're normal. For me, I'm trying to educate the young athletes in a much more basic way on, on what's happening to their body and why. And I think that's really important for all of us to have common understanding of if we all know the best practices on evidence, you can say like, this is why you feel weird when you run. This is why your knee hurts, whatever it is. And that is very empowering for the athlete to feel like they're in control of like, oh, okay, I get it at least. So that's always number one for me. But on a tactical point of view, I'm really trying to focus on the athlete of, okay, what's the plan that we can build for you to, to lower your risk of an injury holding you back, or if you do have an injury and maximize your, your positive potential on a performance point of view. So it's a lot of, a lot of this comes down to, um, doing some boring stuff and motivation to, to keep, to see the future. And then we have other podcasts about how do you actually deal with motivation issues, but it's like teaching the athlete, like we need a lot more time on flexibility. We need a lot more time on basics. We need a lot more time on just doing the things well that you already know how to do and that are not high risk. Right. So we're not going to be learning double folds right now or double backs. We're not going to maybe go for your new release. Like maybe we're going to push this. We can work these drills still, but we're going to kind of push those down the road in terms of like wanting to compete that or wanting to put that in a full work set because it's just not worth it you know what i mean from either like you, get, you actually you know are frustrated and you just have a, a tough time getting it or you actually are at risk for an injury so on a tactical level that's what i'm really focusing a lot on is basics drills flexibility strength conditioning finding the lowest barrier of success that we can keep them happy and making progress at and not throwing so much at them that you know it's going to be really frustrating for them and a lot of this happens with communication between our coaches of like, okay, what bothers them on beam? How can we build a complex around that? What skills can we maybe temporarily do until we get over this little hump of growth and things of that nature? And I think people really need to understand how important planning is here of, of knowing this storm is coming and like, okay, what are we going to do when poor Sally, you know, is, is standing on the sidelines because she, her hamstring's sore and she can't do half the beam complex. What else can we do with her? And we're like, you know, one athlete on for a male side has a shoulder problem and he can't do a lot of rings. What can we give them to be successful and feel part of the group and feel progress? And if you work with your team and get educated from the sources we have, there's a lot of stuff you can do there. So that's my two cents. And then I guess, Nick, I'd really like to hear, you know, when these things are coming up and when you're on the, in this middle two year window where someone's growing a lot or having issue, what are your focuses on to keep that athlete progressing towards their performance goals, not just, you know, not be hurt. Yeah, I think you've covered a lot of it there with regards to, you know, finding the things, the activities to do, which still move the needle in the right direction, um, but without compromising the, you know, the safety of the athlete and, and what's going on. Um, the, can I, can we, what I think we need to mention is that, first of all, we need to have awareness that this period is actually even taking place. Um, because a lot of coaches, and unless unless they're looking for these things and they're not going to know about it. And so maybe we can come back, of course, to the, the measurements and things like that in a moment. So as soon as I'm aware of it and I've got the awareness, I'm going to start to modify the, the number of repetitions. Um, so the total volume of training around some of those higher risk skills. And, and it doesn't need to be everything. There's going to be skills which pose absolutely no risk whatsoever. There's going to be some skills that I'm going to want the athlete to do more of when they're going through that period rather than less. Um, it could be that they still work the big skill but they work it in a very different way. Like you said before, let's say they were doing a, um, trying to think of a good example of a skill, which might maybe, um, it's probably going to be related to a, a, a surface that they're on. Let's say that they're going to be tackling a- Uchenko is a great one. Yeah, Uchenko. Okay, cool. So on, 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 a, on a hard surface, and maybe they've been working that, and it's not that they're going to suddenly stop doing that vault. It might be that we modify the surface that they're, that they're on. Um, and the surface could be a long tramp, of course, a normal trampoline. It could be a softer springboard. It could be they go into pit more rather than going on to um, landing on a hard surface. So they're very much still able to be learning and practicing the skill. And I think that is important, not only for what's happening in the neurology of it, about retaining skill, but also in terms of the athlete's motivation and not feeling like they're just 
well, hang on a minute. I was I was working this skill and, and I've not worked it for months. I'm going to lose the skill. I'm not going to be able to do it again. I'm going to be too far behind. So I think sometimes we can think creatively as a coach about what um, what different uh, drills and preparations we can do so that the athlete is still able to, to work on those skills. But mostly it's a case of modifying volume and surfaces. So a double layout, for example. Now, you know, I can't think of uh, on the top of my head an immediate reason why I wouldn't have a kid who is in the growth period still doing double layouts if they had good technique on a trampoline, like dismounting into a foam pit or on a long tramp onto a soft landing mat. As long as the technique was good, I wouldn't see that that would be a problem. Now, of course, if they're really arching their body and bending in half as they go back, it's a different story. But again, it's just a case of modifying the surface, the surfaces so that they're able to tolerate more and you're not compromising the body whilst they're going through that period. And I think that's what we can, um, that we must remember as coaches is that we don't need to abandon things. We just need to adapt. And that's better for yeah. the athletes feeling and, mo and motivation around that skill as well. Yeah. Super well said. And I'll give a, a very practical, like from the trenches example of what this practice would look like. And then I, I want to definitely touch on the growth thing that you talked about. So like, yeah. for example, we might do, we have 10 and again, COVID asterisks for this, right? So this is going to change it quite a bit, but like if this was happening, right, we have, say I have 12 athletes in a group and we have, we usually do like uh, three separate like substations within like a vaulting rotation because the table height and the board and all that kind of stuff. So maybe we have four athletes that are actually vaulting. We have four athletes that are on a set of stations over here and we have four athletes on maybe a tramp drill or some sort of soft surface, right? So if I know an athlete is going through a rapid growth period or they're having an injury, I might just have that athlete reduce the ratio of hard turns they take with me on the table or put a sting mat over the table when they go, but double up the rounds they take on all the drills. So like, okay, when this group rotates to the hard table, do your five that we're going to do and we'll make sure you're okay. But then you're not going to rotate back through a second time, just hang out with that drill group twice. So you would do, everybody else would do, you know, drill vault, drill stage or tramp stations. You're going to go drill vault, tramp, drill, tramp, right? And you just cut their volume in half. They're still working the things they need to do. They're not ostracized. They're not off on the side of the group. And it's not weird, but they still got their maybe five volts in that they could tolerate some stuff, but they've doubled up on their drills and their soft stuff, their their tumble track trainer, whatever it is, very easy to do uh, on the fly. And so think about that practically about like not making it weird, but having some in your mind, you need to know, okay, what am I going to do with an organizational point of view to do that? You know, so I think that's just hopefully valuable for people who are trying to kind of get into that. But on the monitoring and girl, yeah, there's two things that I find really valuable. And I definitely want to hear Ellen's thoughts on this as well. So one is going to be tracking growth. So the way that I think um, Esteban Bali is from Canada, he's had a really great long term athletic development model research and, and kind of some of this comes from there. But we track um, wingspan in our in our gym. So we have a tape measure on the wall with athletic tape, and we mark the inches. Um, so they kind of reach out and they they their wingspan tells you obviously how long their arms are growing, you have them stand against the wall and you measure their standing height, and then you have them sit and you measure their sitting height. So that gives you the differential between how fast are my legs growing versus how fast my trunk is growing in the arms and extremities, the long bones grow faster, but you're going to kind of have a better idea about it. everyone kind of sees it where you have athletes that have, I've had athletes come to the clinic and they sit in our table and their legs are three quarters of the table and they have huge feet, but their arms are very short and their trunk is short. Like, yeah, we're definitely going through a growth phase here. But what the athletes do is once per month, they put that up on, uh, they measure each other. And then they have a sheet that I have all the months and all their names and they write uh, the inches that they recorded for those three measurements and then the change. So say they changed a half an inch, an inch. And if you see like quarter of an inch, half an inch, quarter of an inch, half an inch, two inches, right? In like a one or two month span, you're like, whoa, wait a minute. That was like double or triple. That's kind of what we might refer to as peak height velocity, which is the time when they grow the fastest because their body's just you know, pouring all the resources into that. And, uh, I think that's usually more of the highest risk. I think there's two and maybe Ellen can correct me. I think there's a, a peak height velocity. That's definitely the biggest, but there's another smaller dip, um, based on, on some different uh, research that you read. So we measure that in terms of, um, a, an objective actual thing we can see, but then our wellness journals are really important here. So we measure daily uh, wellness scores on a zero to 10 scale. And this is some of the research that Ellen and I are working on is from a zero to a 10, how muscularly sore are you? Um, how much energy do you feel you have from a zero to 10 scale? Zero being no energy, 10 being like, I'm ready to roll. Um, what's your mood from a zero to a 10? So zero, do not want to be here. I've had much better days. 10 is like, I'm jumping off the wall, ready to go. And then lastly, is going to be their sleep quality. So are you not getting a zero is low hours of sleep under what you need, low quality of sleep, 
10 is very good numbers. You got seven, eight, nine, 10, and you felt like you slept great. You woke up and you felt amazing. So you put those four in a row and you can get a individual markers, right? But also a wellness score out of 40. So add those numbers up, divide by 40, multiply, you get hundred percent of a wellness score. And that was kind of the research that we were tracking is looking at some NCAA data and seeing like, okay, how does training load, which is a completely separate topic, different podcast for that. But, um, how does that training load impact their wellness score? And then we also look at, okay, wellness score, how's that loading for growth? Like, and then we, it's not, we go by the numbers and say, this is how we're going to train training. All of those things help us have a better conversation, but like, okay, wellness scores don't look great. Everybody else is feeling okay. And you're kind of like having a tough time slash, uh, long arms, <laughs> like long arms in the last two months. Like, are you feeling okay? Is your wrist okay? Are you feeling all right? It just helps you have that conversation with your parents or with them. So that's kind of what I think has been useful practically, but it is in line with some of the, the evidence. And then Ellen, I want to hear anything you have to say here. Yeah, those are great practical techniques. I love the idea of um, measuring, doing some of those measurements, having the athletes participate in that. Not only is it the objective things about, you know, some of the changes for growth, but then how they're feeling. And so I think it normalizes their um, being involved in what's happening with their body and how they're feeling. And then the, the reporting of that, um, whether that's just in the journal or it's a tool to discuss, because the, as we mentioned in the beginning, the whole point of this is to try to um, get uh, correct information, but also good conversation about, um, about you know, this, this time in, in any gym, adolescent gymnast life. The one other thing um, that I'd throw in there to maybe track would be, uh, and, and this really depends, it may, maybe isn't appropriate that the coach has the discussion about, you know, menstrual cycles and menarche. Um, so, you know, really needs to decide like what part, member of the team is going to um, have that conversation or maybe the coach with the parent, but knowing how old um, the athlete's mom was when she had her first period, as well as maybe sisters um, can give you a little bit of genetic information. I mean, if the mom was 18 and wasn't an athlete, then, you know, the fact that she, this, this athlete hasn't had her period by 14 or 15 may have nothing to do with nutrition and training, it may be genetics, you know, purely, but of course you'd want to investigate that. If mom and three sisters had their period when they were 10 and your athlete has not had her period and she's 16, well, then that's a big difference from, you know, the genetic, you know, kind of component. So maybe looking into nutrition and uh, recovery is more important. So that part of uh, the menstrual cycle, when it should start, and then once they've had their period, getting athletes to feel comfortable tracking um, their period, like I said, it gives you a wealth of information and, um, you know, certainly other uh, sports, especially women's soccer, for example, has really gotten into tracking that as part of performance. And we're certainly not using that in gymnastics, but I, I, I you know, I would start with just making it uh, normal, you know, people to think about having their period and that that's a marker of, of health uh, in gymnasts. Yeah, that's great. I actually didn't know that. That's that's phenomenal uh, information to kind of have in my back pocket. Um, yeah, that's really awesome. It's great. And then let's, let's kind of wrap this little small section up on um, something from Nick I want to know about. And then we'll kind of wrap up uh, a little bit with, you know, what's the consequence if we don't do this? Um, but Nick, from your point of view, um, what do you see like in terms of the actual gymnastics skill progression or things they have struggled with? Because I definitely, another like kind of yellow flag in my mind is someone who like could swing giants well, or had a great handstand line or had like great beam series, whatever it is, or was doing really great pommel horse sets. And like, all of a sudden, like the wheels are falling off and like, you've checked the boxes of like, we're sleeping enough where school's not too bad. Like that's, that's for me, that's kind of like, Hmm. But like, what, what are your thoughts on, are there any more things that you track for growth and what do you feel about, you know, what do you see from a technical point of view that might change? Um, I, in terms of what you track, they're probably the same things that I've encouraged as well through my membership things. Yeah. Mood, energy, sleep, soreness. I think they're all really good. Um, RPE score is something, but that's more of a, you know, after training, for example. So I would, I would track that normally on the same sheet. So they would come in and do the, the first, the wellness bit at the beginning, and then they might do an RPE score towards the end of it. So that might give us a, a, another picture as well as to, um, some athletes will quite happily write on there that they don't think that they've actually worked hard. And then, then that's another conversation, isn't it? So, you know, what, why have you not worked hard? Um, but we won't go down that, <laughs> down that rabbit hole. Um, but really, I mean, I think talking to the athletes is, is just so important throughout all of training, not just of course, through this period, because the athlete will, you know, the athlete has a lot of the clues in their mind, you know, yes, you've got the measurements sitting high, you know, wingspan, all those different things. That's going to tell you something. Their wellness scores are going to tell you something else. Your intuition and experience as a coach at seeing how well they're coping with the kind of training volume that you're giving them and how appropriate the skills are, 
you know, that's going to build up another picture as well. But also just having the conversations with the athletes. Because so if, you, if you're actually seeing them struggle with something, then they might have the answer for you. It's just a case of building up a good enough relationship with them. So you can simply say, you know, you seem to be having a, um, a tough time with this skill. You know, have you got any particular reason why you think that might be or, or something that I can help you with? Um, or how do you think we can best achieve this skill moving forward? Is there something that we're not doing that you'd like us to try? And just simple, open, open questions like that, that can really invite their perspective, um, of course, brings you, you know, athlete and coach onto the same level rather than having this kind of superiority. Um, and and uh, I guess a, a form of resistance, you know, that the, that the athlete doesn't feel that they can speak up to the coach. That's So all of that together is really important. But as I just kind of alluded to a moment ago, it might be that you need to modify some of the skills that you felt would have been appropriate for this athlete when they were first learning them, but actually as a result of, you know, their new frame uh, and, and how the period of, of puberty has gone, you might think, well, actually now that that skill might not be appropriate. We might just have to pivot. We might need to do something a little bit different. Um, you know, some of the more extreme uh, flexibility uh, or, or skills that require flexibility, whether that's a, a change leg or a switch leap ring, you would call it, I think in the States, uh, you know, a sheep jump. I, I think you refer to it as a sheep jump, maybe. Um, so, you know, you might look at some of those skills afterwards and say, well, it, OK, it was it was great when you were a 10 year old. But now that you're 14, maybe this isn't the right skill for you. And it's just being smart and say, OK, well, you know, that happens to everybody. Mm. Um, another thing is, I think with the athletes is is using great examples of, of great athletes that are in their 20s, 30s, some of them and performing at their peak mm. and saying, you know, like you're, you're 10 years old and you're stressing about these things now. But. Look, look at this look at this particular athlete you know competing for germany or netherlands or france or, or whatever wherever they're, they're 27 years old and they're competing at the olympics or they're doing a world championships and so you know you've not been alive for the same period that they've been training so just be patient you know and, and coach we've got to remember that as well fortunately the average age of international competitors is increasing that can only be a good thing for the sport and it means that we're able to buy a bit more time at the beginning and say well you know what we don't need these skills for 15 years old. We don't need this athlete to be in their peak at 16. They could they could be in their peak at 28, 29, 30 years old as well. And that's got to be reassuring for everybody, but only if the young athletes know that themselves. Yeah, super well said. And I think that I'm really, I'm like clapping in my head because you said that, you know, it's, it's a really important point to remember of, of showing like, look at these people who are doing so well, 16, 18, 20, 24, whatever it is. And um, yeah, I guess my little caveat too is like, remember that you... You have a large book and not in the compulsory levels always, but we're kind of talking more about the optional level is like you have a large book of skills that can get different requirements. And there's a lot of creative hats you can wear here. I've had many times where, you know, we're, we're working maybe a pack or we're working some sort of shoot over hand. And it's just like, you know, not going to not going to go well because we're hitting a hiccup with growth and stuff. So maybe we just do a, a lower level requirement. We do a, a toe up or something of that nature or just to shoot over to 45. And we take the deduction and just be like, OK, yeah, but we're going to we're going to safely get through this year. And then in the summer when we get our off season, we'll, we'll come back to this. We'll get the resis back out. We'll go back to handstand. We'll try to get these packs going, whatever it is. There's a lot of different examples of where you could kind of with leaps and with jumps with guys and with like high bar requirements. I think ring strength is a huge one. Like just do a regular planche, you know, get the, 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 just take the deduction and get your score. Don't worry about a cross. You know what I mean? Like when they're when you're 12 years old or 13 years old, like it's, it's really not going to go well. So I think it's really good that you said that. And let's just kind of wrap this conversation up with, you know, not in a, not in a doom and gloom way, but like, I think people need to really take the, the, to heart, the, the responsibility we have to treat this period well. And what can happen if we don't respect these, especially I'm thinking like 10 to 14 is where we lose a lot of people to these kind of, uh, aftermath effects but um i definitely kind of want to hear from ellen in terms of the medical side and then nick i'd love to hear more from the performance side about what you feel the track can be changed if we kind of snowball some issues here so ellen what are your thoughts on kind of like the, the possible negatives if we don't really respect this yeah so broad strokes the possible negatives are injury um and then not forming enough bone during a time when you're building all the bone you're going to have for your whole life which can affect you you know much later on um throughout the rest of your life and then just being so frustrated that people leave the sport um and so we i mentioned the female athlete triad before um there's also another term called um, relative energy deficiency in sport they're similar concepts in that um, athletic performance and health depends on adequate nutrition for the type of training that an athlete is doing. And in female athletes, if you're not getting enough nutrition to support the demands of your sport and all the functions your body needs to do, 
You will not get your period or stop having your period. Estrogen in your body is low and bone needs estrogen to heal. So every time we do gymnastics, we break down some of our bone and then our body builds it up. It's a pretty cool process about bone and in our tissues that constantly are being remodeled. But if you don't have the right hormones and nutrition in your body, you can't build it back up. And that's when, of course, these stress fractures can happen. Um, and, you know, as much as we've talked about, you said, I think the majority of people are doing these this well, and then there's, you know, some who aren't. Yeah, there's this extreme example, certainly of, of coaches uh, or parents, maybe or other, you know, teammates saying, you shouldn't get your period, you're not working hard enough. If you do get your period, you know, that's clearly wrong. But I think there's a huge group of people who they're not hearing those really harmful messages, but they're not hearing the right information either. And what we need to know is our athletes are going to learn about puberty and their, you know, periods and, you know, their health as a female athlete, they're going to get it from somewhere. It may be friends, it may be teammates, parents, it may be social media, it could be, you know, what have you, or a combination. I will share one anecdote of, you know, how I kind of got to be interested in this topic is, I mean, as I mentioned before, I was not thrilled to get my period when I was an athlete. And before I was 14, I hadn't had my period yet. And I was at dinner after a meet with some teammates and, and their moms. And one mom had just mentioned, oh, you know, my daughter ended up losing some weight. She doesn't get her period anymore. And I mean, I think I just like stored that in my brain as, oh, that's interesting. You know, I could just if I get my period and I don't want it, I can just lose some weight and, you know, move on. And a year later, when I was about 15, I got my period for the first time and I thought, yeah, I don't I don't want to deal with this. This is this is no good. So, you know, I didn't do anything crazy with my eating, but I stopped eating, you know, the snack before gym or, you know, having dessert or, you know, some kind of random things during the day. I'm not even sure if I lost weight, but I didn't get my period for another year. Um, and then I got a stress fracture in my chin bone, my tibia in a place that takes a long, long time to heal. And I had no idea that any of that mattered as far as, you know, my health and gymnastics. Um, and, you know, quite frankly, when I learned about that, and certainly now it's a, you know, a huge area of, of interest and passion for me is that I just think education is so huge. So if we know these, these processes are important and what's happening you know, in, in our, our bodies as an athlete, parents and coaches, then hopefully we can, like we're talking about, just promote getting through what can be a very challenging time with, you know, with education and reinforcement um, so that you don't have to learn it a harder way by having an injury. And that's really my hope with this is so many of these things are preventable, the frustration and the, you know, the disappointment, and the injuries, not all of them, but a lot of them are. And then I think, you know, this type of conversation hopefully is, is one way to, you know, help people see that. Yeah, that's awesome to hear. And thank you so much for sharing. I think it's really valuable for people to kind of connect the dots on some of those things that happen. And maybe they don't think are, you know, not maliciously, don't think are like, you know, bad, but are definitely a little yeah. you want to check out. Um, yeah, that's great. So let's move on to the next one is um, Nick kind of on your side of the fence in terms of like making a performance goal, a long term performance goal. I think um, I'd love to hear, you know, the, the negative ramifications if someone doesn't really ne negotiate these four years well or so. And I think my two cents is I, I think people are still have this misconception from some really false narratives that we've had and we've seen uh, some documentaries have, have shown this, but um, some false narratives that, you know, you're going to miss your shot. You're going to miss out if you don't really, w you know, get on your, your elite track or here we have hopes and tops and stuff in the States. If you don't like get all your skills and get everything you need, you're going to miss out on your shot because you only have two or three years where you can, you know, you know, succeed quote unquote. So they push kids really hard through the 10 to 14 thinking they're going to miss a window here of critical nature. And you've, you've touched on it with the 20, 30 year old athletes, but performance wise, what do you feel are consequences if someone kind of doesn't, uh, you know, get through this safely? I guess you've got, you've got two different extremes. You've got the, um, the, the coaches that neglect all level of preparation. And so actually when the athlete arrives at a place of puberty, they're not in a, in a physical state to support their, um, their gymnastics training on the other side, let alone through it. So that will be one where the neglecting foundations. And then of course, on the, on the flip side, as we've talked about, you've got the other, the other coaches, which are over training, um, and, and doing too much 
all with the right intentions of just wanting the athlete to be as best you know as they can possibly be or as good as they can be um but then the athlete suffers with overuse injuries and or or you know some of the other things that we've talked about in a time that um they're going to be really vulnerable so we, we need to make sure that we are giving them the optimal dose of training um to make to make sure that we give them the best chance of, of going through that period this is where I think it's worth talking about the difference between process goals and outcome goals as well, because when coaches are so fixated on a specific skill that the athlete might be doing, um, we always talk about controlling the controllables and and an outcome is something that an athlete often has. They'll, they'll, of course, they will have something to do with that through their own process of, of working hard. But if they're going to grow and all of a sudden that skill in the short term is going to become somewhat unobtainable, then that could also lead to the athlete being unmotivated as well. So I think coaches remembering that process goals are normally better than outcome goals. And, and just as by way of an example, if an outcome goal was you need to learn a Tkachev by the time this kid was 13 years old, for example, then that could become unobtainable through no fault of their own. They're growing, you know, and, and the, therefore the, the training plan is going to be modified. Now they failed because they didn't achieve it on time, but the rest of their teammates did. But the process goal might be more to do with, okay, your, the, the, the process or the goal is for you to really work on um, work ethic. It might be that we need to get more or less training volume in, or it might be more attention to detail. You know, these are things that the athlete at any phase of their training can be working on. And mm. therefore, there's not going to be any failure around those those kind of periods. So so that would be important to me as well. Um Coaches need to be brave about making the right decisions, like I said before, for, for long-term performance. And there is an, an element of courage in doing that, particularly when it goes against the norm still. It might go against what other clubs um, are doing within your region. It might go against what other coaches are doing within your club. And therefore, you don't want to be seen as having the kids that are falling behind. But ultimately, you're, they're not falling behind. They're, they're going to accelerate. And the way that I look at this, I talk about like catapult coaching, is that you are you might be holding the athlete back short term. You kind of just, just pull them back a little bit. But in doing so, when you let go of that cap, catapult, it propels them forwards and they can go beyond where the other athletes were. And so mm. I kind of use that term catapult coaching. I quite like that analogy really of, of you're not holding them back long term. You're holding them back short term in order to propel them forwards at a later date. So I think that there's an element of courage there, which which coaches need to have to make those decisions. Um, but really, maybe to summarize this point, it's a combination of hindsight, uh, foresight and, and kind of the current moment. So I would encourage clubs to do an audit of of current and, and past events. So how many kids are coming forwards with with Severs, Oscar Slatters, for example? How many kids are, are you losing in at 10 years old, 11 years old, 12 and 13. They've you laughing because I pronounced something scientific wrong. Is that you? You are. Okay. No, you're not wrong. I just love Oscar. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. You said that one uh, more time. <laughs> <laughs> oh dear. I'm going to not, not repeat that again. Um, but, but have you, has the club got the data to support that and say, well, yeah, we, we're losing, you know, 30% of our, of our kids at 12 years old or 13 years old, you know, it, why is that a good thing? Have we collected feedback? Do we understand why, why they left and are we doing something about it and not just accepting it as the attrition rate at, at this age is that, yeah, we lose loads of kids. Yeah. No, we can do better than that. You know, so I think collecting it, doing like an internal audit from a club's perspective can really tell us a lot. The data doesn't tend to lie. So that will, you know, really give us some good information that we can make better future decisions on. Yeah. Um, one final thing here, if you don't mind, Dave, sorry, is the, is the responsibility that NGBs have to make sure that they have pathways that are appropriate for athletes when they go through these, these kind of stages as well. So I know in the U S system, um, if you don't do level six, one year, it doesn't matter. You can still do it the next year and doesn't matter what, what age you are. Am I right in saying you can just kind of take that level whenever, you, whenever you're ready. So that's great. And other countries need to have a similar model as well in making sure that just because a kid doesn't um, miss out on a particular competition in a particular year, there's not long-term consequences for that child as a result of the pathway that's been put in place um because that in, in itself is going to prevent a lot of kids from com coming forwards and then it becomes an ex exclusive system rather than an inclusive system which allows people to have a bit more time in between those different levels so there's um there's things that ngbs can be thinking about as well in their comp competitive pathways yeah that's fantastic i think people are gonna really value that you shared all that that's super helpful um i have just two things and then i want to kind of give everyone a, an opportunity to kind of share maybe where they find resources and stuff but for me on one side of it i think it's really important that we uh like you said courage and that's what brought this up to me is like we need the courage we need the the fortitude the community um to really 
again, the 10%, that's still not okay. We need to really do a better job of not allowing those practices to continue, right? Like we have to stop normalizing the, the very thin kind of like aesthetic that we know is probably not healthy for the long-term goal, right? And also issues around nutrition and body image and comments about weight and strength and conditioning. Like we really need to do a better job of not allowing those minority practices to continue because of the detrimental effect that it can have on an athlete. And I think it's really important people take to heart that, that, uh, that amount of, of responsibility we have as a community to protect the athletes during this phase by having best practices, using the evidence and things of that nature. So, you know, especially when it comes to like delayed puberty. And I think, uh, that's, that's a, a, a very triggered point, I think important because like you can't normalize not getting your period and having a delayed, you know, puberty. And then somebody goes through a growth spurt when they're later, because they have an, a time off or an injury. And you're like, you know, like, Oh, look at this. Like this is, she's not going to be doing it, blah, 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 because she, she grew. It's like, no, there's nothing wrong with that. That's called being a normal human. And that's we, we, the reality of the situation. So that's my small soapbox. And I think the follow-up that a lot of people are going to have to this is like, okay, how do I know how much is too much? It's a very big topic right now. How do I know I'm too much? I'm on, I'm on the underside, or the overside or the middle side. And for me, it's measuring a couple of things. One is, is there training tracking upwards? Are you making progress in your goals? Are you making progress towards objective things that you you know are going well, right? It's very important. If you're objectively improving, then you're probably on the right dosage. If you're, if you're tanking, you might be non-functional overreaching or having some issues with, with too much or too little. You have to calibrate that. Number two, um, do they, are they happy? Do they generally still enjoy the process? Like bad days, bad weeks happen. But like if the trend is like, this is not fun, I'm losing my passion, I'm losing it, you know, the effort motivation over a month, scratch your head and be like, okay, are we doing something that's too much? Do we need a goal conversation? Is this not the right avenue for you? Is there a better fit of a program? Do we need to tweak your goals a little bit for the next few years? Cause you're just going through a tough time. Um, and then also are your injuries, right? Are your injuries, like you said, are you tracking up or down on the, the pattern of injuries for the whole team? But then as one athlete constantly just getting over and over having issues, scratch your head on your training load and some of the practices you're doing. And then mental health is always for me too. If someone's really having a tough time mentally managing the stress, school's becoming a lot more, and they, they seem to always be agitated or having a low mood, you have to have a conversation. So that that's my uh, that's how I look at it. And that's also what I think a lot of highly performing clubs that I work with or consult with also kind of kind of do that here. So um, those are my parting thoughts. And then I guess I'll give the floor to Ellen to kind of share anything that we, we maybe missed or you think are really important as well. And then Nick, is, you can kind of follow up. I mean, I think you guys really nailed it with your summary statements, I, you know, and, and just to reiterate it, this is puberty is normal and it is temporary and it's our job as adults, um, you know, to help the athlete going through it, to understand that this is not forever and give very concrete strategies to, you know, how to move through this process health, healthily and come out, you know, even stronger than, than they were before potentially. And the catapult analogy is just amazing because um, I think that's, you know, people can really understand what's happening and see how that's really very uh, short period for, you know, potentially a lot of gains. Um, and trying to, you know, avoid it or prevent it is is just way worse than going through it, you know, to, to begin with. So um, that's certainly, you know, the parting thoughts. And, and I think for, you know, parents and coaches, if you have concerns or questions about it involving um, a dialogue with you know, a sports medicine physician who has expertise in this area, certainly talking with the physical therapist if they're working with them, sports dietitians, there's exercise physiologists. I mean, by no means do you need a huge team at all times, but there are people um, that, you know, do these very specific skills. And it's it's great to ask for help or a consultant if you're not sure of what's going on, if it's normal or how you can help your athlete through it. That's great. Yeah. Nick, anything to kind of add for parting thoughts? Uh, I don't think so. I think I've kind of made um, all the points that I was hoping to. Um, I just wanted to say that I'm really grateful to have the opportunity to come on to um, talk about this. And I've learned loads. I've, I've got my notepad here. I've lit, written about three pages out of notes here of, of different stuff. So I'm sure that the audience is going to find this really, really useful because I've learned a lot from both of you. So uh, yeah, good conversation, guys. I've enjoyed it. Thank you, buddy. Likewise. Yeah. And I guess the, the last little thing is resources, right? If you want to know more about the three little spokes in the wheel we have here, if you want more of the medical stuff, the geeky stuff, there's phenomenal statements from the IOC and, uh, you know, the new, uh, dietetics guidelines and stuff like that on red S syndrome. There's plenty of medical things. If you're interested in that, uh, Twitter or email me and Ellen, we'd be happy to give those to you. If you guys are looking more for like the practical stuff, I point you all the way to Nick in, in terms of like what to do with the actual ground level tactics of how do I help with drills and skills and progressions and circuits and things like that. Like Nick's got phenomenal content and obviously 
I have a lot of information kind of on the strength conditioning, the flexibility, the cultural or the medical side. So there are loads of resources. I also think David Epstein's book, um, range is a phenomenal read just to kind of get your, your head wrapped around some new ideas. My buddy, Josh Eldridge was saying these things to me in 2014 and I was like, nah, you don't know what you're talking about. And now I'm like, yeah, he helped me a lot. You know, he opened my mind out quite a bit. So read that book with an open mind or listen to his Ted talk, which is 15 minutes. Like it'll rethink the way you approach like early speculation, 10,000 hours rules and stuff like that with like Tiger Woods versus some other people. Um, so that would be my parting thought is, is kind of get some resources there. Education is definitely king or queen. Cool. I think we're good. Thank you guys so much for joining us. And uh, if you guys have any questions, definitely get, we're very active on social media. So let us know and we'd be happy to help you out.